Fáil to Orav Urug and welcome to We Love History Live. I'm Ruri from the Gaelic team at Arinjoch Echtriol Alpe or Historic Environment Scotland. Now, typically with these types of events, we tend to speak to experts and academics that work within the organisation, either to highlight a particular area of work or to look at a uh, particular project that we are undertaking. This week, however, we are broadening out slightly and in the spirit of our new policy on intangible cultural heritage, or ICH for short, we are delving into Gaelic mythology. This can be done through songs and stories and today it's going to be with Deirdre Graham, who is a Gaelic singer and musician from the Isle of Skye. Fáil tóir sa Deirdre, cymerhaw. So, just before we get into the actual nitty gritties, and for those of you who may not be aware, Intangible Cultural Heritage, or ICH, or Living Heritage, as it's also commonly known, is a collective term that describes the body of our heritage that relates to elements such as stories, songs, poetry, human ritual and ceremony. It's what you might call in some ways the opposite end of the heritage spectrum. It's far removed from the the nature of built heritage, I suppose, and the, the study of archaeology as it concerns itself with the transmission of language and cultural beliefs, uh, customs and ideas and holds uh, a unique place, particularly in particularly in the heart of Gaelic communities, but I think that's true of every community uh, the world over. So we at HES, we've been highlighting the importance of uh, ICH and this type of heritage through our strategy for the historic environment, our place and time, uh, our Gaelic language plan, and most recently through a new policy uh, statement on ICH that sets out intentions to host events such as this one right now. So I'm going to do a short, a very brief introduction in Gaelic uh, for our Gaelic speaking audience and perhaps for some of you who are watching at home that may have not even ever heard a word of Gaelic. Um, so call it um and you, how dare you get a Hadderi Erevi in Sas on in Kyol, I guess cool turn the Gaelic, Fonichai Tokol on in Brechkishisho, I kill the Jess and Yelen Skiani. Hamisha Yolach Erin Jerev Tayat, a Hyungavil, Shinya Brahid is pure Rihede. Hadderi it came a Hosnig von RCS on a glass of who, Fadden Dwari Achachig on Vohenachainbel, a misk Yolichin either. So with me today in English is Dirty Graham. Deirdre is a Gaelic singer and musician from the beautiful Isle of Skye, growing up in the South End community of Lower Breckish, which itself is steeped in its own plethora of Gaelic myths and legends, including magic trees, wells, and even in a famous ghost car to boot. It's all just a stone's throw from Deirdre's house. And of course, I know all of this, uh, as Deirdre is, in fact, my sister. So we share. We have a shared understanding um, growing up where we did of the local stories that surrounded us. So that's kind of what we're going to tap into today. However, unlike myself, Deirdre has built upon this knowledge going forward. She's gained a first degree in Gaelic traditional music and song uh, with folklore attached in the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland in Glasgow and has gone on to study Gaelic myths and legends as a lifelong passion, incorporating that into her career as a professional musician and tutor. And one last thing before we get into it is just to remember, if you have a question during this live chat at all, you can ask us. Um, if we don't get around to answering them all before the end of the live stream, we'll do our best to get back to you with an answer in the next couple of days. Um, so. Just to jump into question one, is Deirdre, where did your fascination with Gaelic traditions and myths come from? Well, it, I suppose it was absolutely impossible not to have a, an appreciation of the stories and songs and culture surrounding 
fairies and mythical creatures and superstitions and the other world because you know as well as I do growing up our mum had so many so many stories and we were absolutely steeped in that mainly predominantly from mum but also we were so fortunate to grow up in a village that had so many older um, generations that lived and breathed this tradition and we would get you know first second-hand accounts of these stories and songs some of them so so localized you mentioned the ghost car there's at the the top of our village there's a fairy bridge a couple of crofts along a couple of fields along there's um a well that's said to have been occupied by a, a fairy man that came to um that came to um have a word with a woman who wasn't tending to the cattle correctly and discipline her. So in our tiny hamlet, in our tiny village, there are so many stories. And then further afield in the rest of the world, there are incredible stories and songs linked to different districts, different parishes on the island. And so I just always found them really interesting and really enticing, intriguing stories. Grant, yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Uh, perhaps maybe just taking a step back and um, for, for those that are watching at home, I mean, let's just start with what is what is a fairy? <laughs> um, I think what's important to point out is that the fairies are not what we might have a preconceived idea of them. We've got um, the Disney version of a fairy, your Tinkerbell and everything, a small flying creature, the wings, the fairy dust. Um, and that kind of cutesy character is certainly not what rings with me as what a fairy is. So my understanding of what the fairies are would be a folk or a being that's quite closely connected to humans. And they live so interlinked with our lives, living in fairy knolls or, or little hillocks. Um, and they're almost people like, but can kind of take a slightly different form. In some cases, in, in many songs, cite relationships between men and women and the fairies. Uh, some songs cite kind of a fairies um, changelings. That's actually a really interesting part of the fairy mythology where you have changelings would be babies that were um, where a family would have a baby, a, a fairy would come and take that baby away and replace it with a changeling, which at first sight might appear to be that baby, but in fact, as it got older, it would start to, to show kind of personality traits that weren't human-like and maybe a bit fairy-like. They would perhaps develop cross personalities. And fairies were very beguiling and enticing, as I mentioned before, but they were quite feisty and menacing creatures. And a good a good dose of mischief about them. So I, I, I folk that were interlinked and but also to be slightly fearful of or in awe of. But so long as you had a lot of respect for them, you could work people and fairies could work together quite harmoniously. Yeah, and it's it's you know it's quite funny, you know, thinking of thinking of mo modern people, say the average modern person and um, I, I suppose it would probably be quite difficult for them to connect with a lot of what you're saying. How people had this had this actual tangible fear of of fairies. But I mean, going back to to Gaelic communities across the Highlands, I mean, what, what, was it really were they really that uh, that afraid, or did did they actually really believe in this stuff? Yeah, well and truly, absolutely, there was. Not too long ago, you know, someone actually, mum spoken about just who would have a, a grandparents. We're looking at two generations ago, perhaps three generations ago, as close as that, where people truly, truly believed in them and have accounts of having met with the fairies and spoken with the fairies and having encounters with them, both positive and negative. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, people genuinely, genuinely believe in or believed and they... They, there are such close accounts, but I think what's difficult in our age I, I, to truly believe in them, I, I think there's a correlation between um, the globalisation of the world where we now don't only have nation, like countries watching the same TV programmes or, or you know, using, using digital media 
we have a whole, you know, an international, global world where we're so connected on one level and our culture has almost become international. And I think there's, in some regards, there's a kind of a, a tradition has kind of fallen away a bit where we don't just have our, our local communities now. So these, I think there's the correlation between that and tradition, um, local active tradition is declining, kind of would would make it understandable that we have less belief in the fairies these days. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. But maybe belief, belief in the fairies is quite an interesting thing as well, because, you know, looking back, um, looking back now, um, you know, it, it could be interpreted as uh, as having some practical sort of use, as well as the kind of absolute belief that people would have in fairies. Um, that they would serve as warnings and such. And I wonder if you can speak a bit about that. Yeah, I think as well, because these days we do look for, for meaning in kind of beliefs and superstitions. And I think nowadays, perhaps in the case of the changelings that I mentioned, the changelings could be explained with um, potentially some kind of um, learning difficulties or learning disabilities that children might develop. So what we know now about... Um, for example, autism or or other such things, we might put that down to a change thing where, where we might talk about the nature of the child changing slightly. Um, but as well, when you're speaking of warnings, I think there are so many songs that um, serve as a warning. A lot of these songs are used as kind of lullabies as well. So when you're you're singing to a child, you're you're using that those that fairy repertoire to kind of warn a child of not going near the fairies because potentially where they live might be in a dangerous place. Coming away, broadening out slightly from just the fairies where they're mythical creatures living in lochs and in the sea. A lot of these would would portray kind of quite a, a scary character to to keep children away from danger, keep them away from locks and, uh, and running, you know, dangerous waters, um, caves and everything. A lot of these have songs associated with them and stories to, to keep people safe. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, th thinking of um, thinking of back home and the Isle of Skye, um, Dunvegan kind of um, comes to mind and uh, the fairy flag that they've got in Dunvegan Castle there. Um, what, a, what, a, what about a wee bit about that? What's the, what's the fairy flag and what does that kind of mean? Yeah, I guess I've said I, I've kind of commented that the fairies could be quite mischievous and menacing, and and people were slightly in awe of them or held great respect for them for fear of of uh, something terrible happening to them. But the fairy flag is actually a lovely account where. Um, the, the fairies would work with the people and it, it, there was support there and a good relationship. So the fairy flag is um, a flag that was gifted from the fairies to clan chief McLeod of the Began and Harris in the north end of the island. And the fairy flag is now displayed in Dunvegan Castle. And it's said it's a beautiful em, embroidered piece of material and you can actually see it on display in it. Um, and it's said that the fairies granted the MacLeods three, almost like the, the genie's like three wishes or three chances to use the fairy flag to protect them, to protect the MacLeods. And the first unfurling, I believe, was when the clan chief's son had taken ill and so they unfurled the fairy flag um, in order to, um, to help the, the clan chief's son. So it would get better. But the the second unfurling it was the last time it's ever been used. And it was in the Battle of Miligari in Waternitch up the north end of the island. Uh, in the Battle of Miligari in 1570. And the MacLeods were invaded by Clan Bannon's army. They came over in their boats and there were said to be quite a number of men there and the MacLeods realised that they didn't have a chance in this battle. So they unfurled the fairy flag and they used it for the for the second time. And what that did was the the fairies conjured up a much larger army for the MacLeods. So it appeared 
that there were hundreds and hundreds of men or thousands of men, when in actual fact there were only a few men in MacLeod's army. And when Clan Ranald saw this, they retreated, knowing that they had absolutely no chance against this enormous army. But when they retreated to the shores, back to their galleys, the MacLeods were waiting for them because, of course, what the what they saw was not, in fact, a large army, but the fairies had conjured up this image. And so the MacLeods could go down to the shores and uh, do away with the Clan <laughs> army. And um, it's an incredible story of kind of the fairies and the people working together. And that's the last time the fairy flag has ever been used, actually. There's another chance. But the, um, there's a song that goes, a beautiful song, quite an unusual melody, and it talks La Miligari, it's the day of Miligari, and it's talking of that battle and the story behind it, of course, being the fairies unfurling the flag. Great. Can we get a, are we, can we get a special rendition at all, do you think? A world exclusive, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just take a few snippet of it then. So... Eh ho ro ho ro ho An ko a fa sha O pi 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 ho ro ho Wa ka na ha sha Eh ho ho ro ho ro ho Lovely! I think that deserves a round of applause. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's obviously brilliant. It's, it's quite funny thinking of the, the three uses of the fairy flag. It's almost like the three rubs of the genie's lamp or, or something like that. Um, funny how these things come in threes. We've got a, we've got a, a question coming in online about, um, about place names. Well, Kind of fairy glens and fairy lochs, um, and there's a fa there's the fairy glen up uh, in Uig in North Sky. There's uh, tons of fairy glens um, uh, all over the place, and fairy lochs. Are, are they? I suppose would they be normally attributed to where fairies live? Is that yeah. how they get their name? I suppose so, and I think something about the fairies is. For example, the, the Fairy Glen up near Ruik, if you ever get a chance, you'll have been there, but if you ever get a chance to visit, the Isle of Skye is so kind of known for its dramatic landscaping. You've got big mountains and quite dramatic and, and bold landscape. And then the Fairy Glen is entirely different. So the way it looks, there's all these tiny little hillocks and the, the grass is said to be very green, but even greener than normal. And really small, petite kind of landscape in amongst all this boldness. So it's it's strikingly different. Um, and so there would there would be I guess that would probably be a, a fairy knoll um, or a hillock. Um, and then your your fairy pools and your fairy um, bridges and whatnot would have a story more attached to it, but. I think kind of that that the most obvious to me anyway that jumps out at me would be the fact that that scenery particular fairy glen just looks so different and so out of place in in its surrounding landscape that it would be natural to attribute the the, the other world or that as an entrance into the other world. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I remember going camping up there as a as a teenager, and you definitely got that sense of. The strange kind of hillock <laughs> uh, formations um, uh, as the kind of fairy knolls. So, uh, I suppose, say, say if you were to if you were to go out uh, these days and encounter a fairy, um, what would what would be your your top tips on fending off any um, any evil fairies? Okay. Um... Well, there are a few, I would say. Actually, one is a lot of people would plant a rowan tree in their garden. And rowan trees are said to ward off the fairies. So that would be, number one, get planting some rowan trees in your garden keep the fairies away. Um, don't try and outwit a fairy, I would think. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they, they'll win it. 
Um, try not to get enticed in with them, uh, in by them. Fairies can't cross running water. So if you're on the other side of a, a stream, there's a beautiful song about that. A, a fairy woman, um, Rani Alapal, and she's trying to go, come over here, come over the stream, because she knows she can't get across the stream to pull him in. And uh, he manages to to stand his ground, but she's stamping her feet by the end of the song. Mm-hmm. Beauty is she's not getting her way. But um, if you are enticed into a fairy knoll, and you might be enticed by the beautiful music, the aesthetically beautiful music, if you hear a, a, a party going on in a, in a fairy knoll, don't go in. But if you do, then don't eat the food. There'll be a big banquet, there'll be a feast. Don't touch the food. They'll be singing and dancing all night. A really good Kaylee going on. <laughs> and uh, it's said, though, that if you go in for the night and you dance and sing with them and join in that merriment, then you leave at the end of the night. But in actual fact, 100 years have passed. So life's going to have changed, as you know it. So it's not, it's not wise to go in. <laughs> yeah, I definitely wouldn't mess with the fairies. Absolutely not. <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, that, that, that's fantastic. I was wondering if we could, uh, just to say to everybody watching as well, we're, we're still open to, to hearing your questions. Um, so if you'd like to get them in, we'll try and get them answered uh, while we're on air. We've got one in, in Gaelic, which is great to see. Uh, and that's Jane Skeel of uh, What's your favourite um, myth or story? That's a difficult one, isn't it? It's kind of like asking you what's your favourite film of all time or something. Exactly. Uh, There's a story that I absolutely love and really you'll probably remember this from growing up, Colin Gunchelm and uh, it's not a fairy story, I mean there, there are so many I could go on but um, there's a story of Colin Gunchelm who... Well, what does that mean, Colin Gunchelm? Man without a head. So this man, <laughs> <laughs> this is more a ghost story than a fairy story. In, in tea, but it, it's a connected um, tradition. Uh, he'd lost his head, potentially. Was he beheaded or whatnot? And then he was, he was quite bitter. And when he would see people going by, he would get his head and throw it at them <laughs> and knock them off their horses. And he was wreaking havoc over, I think it was a motor. Um, over on the mainland, over in Motherwell, until one day, I think, I believe it was Ian Garrett, who's this, um, uh, Ian Garrett, Machpira Chalm Raza, um, who was of the MacLeod lineage over in Razi. Ian Garrett was um, thinking, right, enough's enough. And uh, he he went along and Colin Gunchyang went to throw his head and uh, Ian Garrett caught it catch it on a sword. I might be adding to the story here. And he it's said, all part of the fun. <laughs> We've had enough of that. Cut it out. And so Colin Kinkian was told. But there's a there's a nice song that goes with it and he's singing kind of I'm a long way from Bing Aethera from from Bing Aethera, which I think is on the Isle of Sky. A good sky connection. Interestingly I think Ian Machila Kalambara like Ian Gareth um he actually was returning to Razi, just off the Isle of Skye. He was returning to Razi on a boat, coming back from a christening in Lewis in 1671. And the the boat sank. He was drowned at sea. And I think they say that the, there were witches that conjured up a storm and caused his boat to capsize. So, so many of our songs and so many of our stories are interlinked um, with each other. But that would be a favourite kind of definitely one I used to love hearing when I was younger. As far as fairy stories go, just I just like it all. I like all the complexities of it. How there's there's good and bad and mischief. I particularly like the mischief. Yeah, and one one um, the another question that's just coming in. It's about the um, the John Gregerson Campbell collection of the the, the Gaelic other world. Yeah. Um, and I know that you've got a copy as as do we at Historic Environment Scotland from that quite uh, quite heavily for our social content. Um, so somebody uh, is asking how um, 
how accurate are the collections of superstitions and stories made by the likes of John Gregerson Campbell in the 1800s? I suppose it's quite difficult to say how, if, if you could describe them as accurate as in is giving credence to those beliefs uh, in a modern world. But um, do, you, do you have anything to say about his collections? This, I mean, I think we are so fortunate in our tradition, and this goes way beyond our kind of mythical and, and fairy beliefs um, and stories. We're so, so lucky we've got an incredibly strong um, tradition-bearing kind of legacy. And so many of these stories would have been um, documented and passed on through the oral tradition. And there would be slight variations in different localities. You're going to get the kind of same stories uh, appear in different parts of the country, but one person's telling of it could differ so slightly from another person's telling of it, but it's the same theme. So I think in terms of accuracy, like it's impossible to tell really, but I think what, what we should celebrate is that we have all these incredible accounts and they're, they're drawn together. And we've, we've actually got a pretty well-documented tradition there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the questions are flying in thick and fast oh. now. It's, it's quite great. Um, so, so, so I think I'm going to tie this question in. Somebody is asking, uh, do we think the folk, that folklore had an educating value in stopping kids being disobedient and adults from being irresponsible towards nature? And, and that, I don't know about you, but that, this kind of makes me think of the Ehushka, um, where you have... The it's a, a Gaelic version of the the kind of Kelpie is the Kelpie is more is perhaps better known because of the the sculptures and in, in Fife, um, but you know I've 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 heard and read about the Kelpies as having a a, a sort of warning effect either for children not to go near water or I think there's for young maidens let's say not to be um, not to be attracted to to uh, to to uh, strain strangers or strange men and all that Absolutely. kind of stuff. So, yeah. Absolutely. So the the Erhuska is a is a grim kind of area. It's it's quite sinister. Where the Erhuska would live in uh, freshwater locks, and so you you've got potentially the warning of keeping children away from locks, but you've also there's there's a song. Which is my love let me back to my mother. And that tells the story of a woman who fell in love with a Yahushka because the Yahushka could take a human form and it's shapeshift. And um, this woman was courting this uh, Yahushka and she, she said to have gone to visit him one day and she was stroking his hair. It's when she was stroking his hair she felt the grains of sand and the and the weeds in his hair, which was, oh, oh this is danger, this is actually an Echushka. And the Echushka had a really, really, they were so dangerous, they were told to drag people into the into the water with them. So, on a, in a literal context, but this song, actually, if you look at the words, it's a conversation, and she's pleading with this Echushka to let her back to her mother, she'll say, She's saying, my brothers and sisters will be furious with you. They're going to come and look for me. My mother and father will be upset. You've got to let me back. Let me back. And he's saying, no, nope, no, nope, you're not. You're not at all. And so there's a real kind of uh, uh, a very strong warning there that I mean, it still applies, of course, you know. But um, so not just in the in the sense of waters but also in a kind of stranger danger or, or being being just a bit careful yeah for sure and that uh that song that you mentioned uh mm. do you think would you think we could get a wee, if you if yeah. you're up for it, a wee rendition of that as well we'll we'll have to kind of wrap up quite soon yeah. but i think it'd be quite nice to have another another reverse it's a lovely song and what's kind of um what might strike at odds is that it um 
it's quite beautiful and it's almost like a lullaby. It's quite a gentle lulling song. And again, potentially sung by, by people singing to their children. So from an early age, you are aware and that's kind of embedded those warnings in a subtle, gentle way. But so this goes... Lovely, excellent. Um, I'm just gonna. I've, there's a couple more questions. We, if we get, we we'll get through a, maybe a couple more quite quickly. I'm seeing that somebody is somebody is asking the tale of people losing time when seeing fairies sounds like folk losing time when seeing UFOs. Is there any connection there? Um, I don't know. You lost time in seeing UFOs, but I imagine that, that's something I definitely want to look into. But I imagine that yeah, I think it's probably the same. Same situation. That would be my my hunch. Uh, that something we touched on just a little bit is these superstitions and beliefs and features and, and beings repeat all around the world. So you might have a tradition in other places, whether it be UFOs, whether it be another kind of um, context, would have the same the, the same warnings and the same stories come out of it. Yeah, sure. It's, I was just thinking that as well. It's quite interesting how thinking about it. How uh, well the the depictions of a fairy knoll that I've seen is maybe a wee bit similar to the to the the UFO kind of discs, flying Wait. discs. Ah, it looks like there's that circular kind of. Yeah, mm -hmm. and there's uh, just to to round off. It's another Gaelic one actually. I'm really impressed. I'm really. Best that we've got so many Gaelic uh, questions to do, Shin Ma. Um, and it asks, could you have a hoon ski a lock and reloadic on and skied in Eda in Gaeltoch? Yeah, a will be a stin iter yaliche id fiaganache. So I think this asking really is their comparatives to our stories in different regions of, uh, of the Highlands. And even I've heard that there's that there's different talking about the Ehushka, I mean there's there's different versions of Ehushka up in Shetland and Orkney yeah. and places like that as well. It's, yeah. For sure. And and beyond Scotland as well. You've got your Ehushka, you've got your Kelp, then you've got your Selkies, you've got in um, in Gaelic, you've got your your kind of um, seal woman who came to shore and the skins were put in the rafters and then she returned to the sea. You would have stories of mermaids across the world. Um, I was listening recently to a podcast talking about um, the traditions of the fairy folk and and myth mythical creatures in Ireland, of course, that your leprechauns, your, your banshee and everything is all a very interlinked um, a tradition and, and culture. So yeah. Yeah. Grant, well, I think that's just about all that we've got time for, I'm afraid, folks. But um, I see that there's questions still coming in. So what we'll endeavour to do is to try and get back to you with information within the next couple of days. Um, dear, dear, if there's any sources uh, where people can look for uh, myths through Gaelic songs. Um, we'll be sure to get that off you and, and distribute that um, as well to f people. Uh, but I'd just like to say, more than thank our son, Chien Kucharum and Jew. It was uh, thanks very much for joining uh, us today. It was really, uh, really, I really enjoyed the conversation. Actually, it was very interesting and great to be able to kind of um, delve back into these old stories that was so part of uh, of our upbringing at home yeah. and so part of you know our historic environment in general in in highlands and and further afield as well um so that's it uh thanks so much guys for listening and uh we will see you next week with another live stream <laughs>